which is a mobile Great. it's a mobile app centered around women empowerment and mentorship in Africa. So today's dialogue is feminist leadership. It's going to be quite an exciting one. We have wonderfully diverse speakers from uh, we've got somebody from Seychelles, Malawi, Canada, and up in South Africa, <laughs> up into Africa. And so it's quite a packed program today. And we just want to thank um, our hosts and the facilitators of this dialogue, which is Gender Links in partnership with Southern Africa Gender Protocol Alliance and Women's Voice and Leadership, um, Canada Global Affairs and Amplify Change. Before we kick off, there's just a few ground rules that we'd like to place. So first of all, please feel free to use the chat box. It's there to um, just elevate the discussion and aid in the discussion. Let us know who you are, um, where you're from, uh, questions you have, commentary on the discussions that you've got. Um, so please make use of that. And then a plea to the speakers. Um, this is um, a wonderfully packed program, so please keep um, your part of the dialogue concise and to the point and brief so that we can make sure that we do get everybody in on time and in the time that we've got. And then one last thing um, with such contested subjects and topics that we're speaking on today as they are, we have had some trouble with hacking in the past. So. We will um, be looking out for that behind the scenes. So please don't be alarmed if something happens. Um, we will try and just get rid of it as soon as possible and then carry on. Okay, thanks very much everybody. And welcome to anybody who's new and who hasn't been following the dialogues as yet and journeying with us. Um, we're excited to have you. So to kick off, I'd like to give the floor to Susan, Susan Tolne, our Gender Links Associate. She's going to be just framing the conversation and building on from demystifying feminism and the African feminism dialogues that we've um, had um, just recently. So Susan, are you there? Hi, thanks very much, Jazz. Yes, I am. I'm not going to put my camera on. I'm not having a good looking day. <laughs> Um, so, um, good afternoon, friends and partners. Um, it's so good to see so many of you online um, and uh, joining us for, um, as Jazz says, our third and final dialogue on feminisms. So, Gender Links has been holding these dialogues during the Women's Month, South African Women's Month. Um, it came out of a result from an evaluation with WVL grantees, which found that just 14% um, of the organizations were comfortable with identifying themselves as feminist organizations. So in the first uh, dialogue, we unpack the term feminism to, de to, to demystify the term, which is um, was described as alienating um, as by one of the um, by, by one of the grantees. Uh, so we so we wanted to start to demystify the term um, and understand you know what 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 the reservations are with people um, identifying as feminist. And we also learned a little bit about um, Canada's feminist foreign policy. In the second dialogue, we heard from a number of African feminists, stalwarts, uh, we, to learn about feminism, what feminine means to them in the African context. Um, we, and then today um, is our final dialogue, and we will be discussing feminist leadership. This comes out of the fact that Genderlinks uh, is a leader of the Action Coalition 6, uh, which were the Action Coalitions were established by the UN um, at, the, um, at the Mexico conference in 2020. Um, and we'll hear today from country leaders, the country leaders of the Action Coalition on Feminist Movements and Leadership, Canada and Malawi. Um, and we'll learn um, from idea about feminist leadership and women's yeah. participation. Um, and then finally, we'll also learn from, um, from other participants mm -hmm. around what feminist leadership looks like for young women and for the LGBTIQA community. Uh, looking really forward to today's discussion. Um, and I hope it enriches what we've, what we've already been um, learning in the past two. Thanks very much, Jazz.
Wonderful. Thank you very much, Susan, for um, just bringing us back into the context of the overall dialogue itself. Um, so first up, very exciting, we have our um, Senior Development Officer at Global Affairs Canada, Sitsi Fungorani. Are you, are you with us? Yes, she is. Okay, wonderful. Um, just to bring us into this, we're going to be hearing um, from a Canadian perspective regarding feminist leadership, especially, um, which is quite fantastic coming in from the last one, which was um, African feminism. We'd like to have some, um, also a, a globalized look. And so we're going to hear now from Titsi. Thank you, welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Jez. Um, so I'm not going to go into uh, the nitty gritties of um, Gener Generation Equality Forum itself, uh, but I'm going to talk about um, Canada's role and uh, where we are coming from and how we're contributing uh, to this forum uh, as, as Canada. So, you know, really delighted to be a part of this um, forum and to co-lead the Feminist Movements and Leadership Action Coalition. Um, so not just on this coalition action, action coalition, but also as a member of the Women, Peace and Security and Humanitarian Action Compact, uh, but also a commitment maker in other action coalitions, uh, such as the GBV, Economic Justice and Rights and Bodily uh, Autonomy, SRHR and Feminist Action for Climate Action. So although we are um, a, a core lead on feminist leadership, but we're also a commitment maker um, in others. And uh, Canada announced $180 million in new funding at the Gender Equality Forum, Paris Forum, to achieve several concrete policy and financial commitments with a focus on unpaid and paid care work, girls' education, gender equality in leadership, civic education, ending child, early and forced marriage, support to LGBTIQ organizations, and um, gender lens investing. Gender Equality Forum has set a bold uh, feminist agenda that tackles persistent barriers to gender equality and uh, it underpins the values of intersectionality, inclusivity, and collaboration presenting the opportunity to work with new stakeholders and non-traditional partners. The forum pre presents a unique opportunity to renew momentum and accelerate progress on gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls in all their diversity, particularly in collective efforts to build back better in our COVID-19 response and, and recovery. The GEF represents a valuable opportunity for Canada to share uh, the lessons that we have, have had as we promote gender equality, uh, both locally and internationally. But it also gives us an opportunity to advance our own feminist um, foreign policy and the commitments that we make. In the first um, dialogue, I shared uh, how um, we are advancing the feminist foreign policy and how it translates to um, the work that we do globally. And throughout the, um, um, gender equality, generation equality process. Canada has advocated for the rights and needs of girls and adolescent girls to be considered, considered in all action coalitions, ensuring the meaningful participation of adolescent girls and young women in all their diversity. I think there was a realization that um, you know, young people need to be part of the conversation and to be at the table. So Canada has been one of the, the leaders that have been advocating that um, adolescent girls and young women be on the table to, to make decisions um, and to uh, kind of uh, pave the way um, as well as in their own right as leaders. Um, and then just going deeply into the feminist movement and the Leadership Action Coalition, um, this is alongside other governments uh, and we are core leaders with Malawi and I'm sure we're going to hear from Mayor uh, uh, Emma Kalia, who is going to speak, but there's also Netherlands um, as co-lead, and there are CSO partners as well, as um, Suzanne has said, Gender Links is one of those, and other philanthropic organizations and the private sector. So it's really a multi-sectoral um, uh, leadership 
of this uh, action coalition. And um, it really provides an opportunity for strategic collaboration amongst current and future gender equality champions from civil society and all these um, sectors that I have mentioned, including government and the private sector. And the multi-sectoral collaboration, it brings further strength, it, it brings stability, institutional support for women's organizations and movements, uh, which are really crucial to advance gender equality and women's leadership and eliminating poverty, including uh, building more inclusive uh, and peaceful, uh, sustainable and prosperous uh, societies. Um, and uh, this is something that we, we uh, believe in that uh, you know, for, for, for movements to be strong, we also need to build uh, strong organizations and it needs to be uh, as broad based as, um, as it can be. And um, the Action Coalition focuses on strengthening women, women's organizations, ampl amplifying their voices and supporting their leadership, ref reflecting Canada's priority of working hand in hand with local women's organizations is part of um, the feminist foreign police agenda. And the women's voice and leadership is one example where uh, Canada is providing uh, over 150 million dollars, uh, support to 33 organizations and 31, in 31 countries. And South Africa is one of them. And um, kudos to, to, to Gender Links who is implementing this project and the women's rights organizations that are um, receiving uh, grant support and uh, the work that they're doing on the ground. Um, and that work has been recognized and South Africa is one of the, our best um, pro performing projects globally on the WVL program. So uh, really um, something that we're really proud of is the High Commission of Canada in South Africa. And uh, the Action Coalition leaders, they continue to address the barriers to women's leadership, representation and decision making. So it's not really just about adding the numbers but we also want to talk, talk about and tackle the barriers um, and the challenges that women face when they want to access these spaces of leadership, uh, decision making, and um, you know, including those that are, have been increased, those challenges that have been increased by COVID-19. Uh, and this has provided an impetus to act collectively and support the full political empowerment of women at all levels uh, of politics and, and public life. I want to uh, go now as I um, um, go towards the end of my presentation to talk about the Alliance for Feminist Movements, which has come out of this um, out, out of this action area, and um, the the launch of the Alliance for Feminist Movements was announced by Canada alongside the Equality Fund and the Ford Foundation at the closing of the Mexico Forum as a, com a collective commitment for the feminist movements and leadership action coalition. The Alliance has mobilized more than 300 organizations, including governments, uh, philanthropy and civil society working together to increase and improve resources, as well as mobilizing partnerships and political support for feminist movements, agendas and policies. And these uh, governments include uh, Canada, these Netherlands, Sweden, the UK, Malawi, Ireland, and Mexico. And the um, uh, foundations that are involved in this um, alliance include uh, Ford, uh, Gates, CIFF, Open Society Foundations, and also women's funds, such as the Global Fund for Women, Equality Fund, Global Green Grants, uh, and international organizations such as the UN Trust uh, to End uh, Violence Against Women, uh, as well as uh, rights organizations and networks such as AWID and Count, Count Me In Consortium. So um, in this way, we, we're really hoping to bring in um, different voices and um, uh, different strategies to, to tackle uh, you know, and, and advance gender equality. And the co-creation process, it then culminated into a, a publication of a website uh, since July 2022, this is recent, and the launch of the Alliance during the high level week of the UN General Assembly. This partnership will create a new and dedicated space for sustained dialogue uh, and planning among donors, feminist movements and organizations 
between governments and among uh, governments and other donors, including women's funds. Um, so this is important to note that while the Alliance will take on an advocacy role to increase the number and diversity of funders supporting feminist movements, funds and organizations, it is not envisioned, uh, envisioned uh, that it will be a pooled um, funding mechanism, uh, nor will it administer funding. So it's really uh, not a, a pool where you can uh, apply and get funding from, but it is really for, for planning, for dialogue, um, and for sharing strategies. Uh, so, you know, including governments and alliances, it really sends a, a strong signal about uh, countries' commitments and uh, their prioritization uh, to funding and supporting feminist movements and organizations and advancing the multi-stakeholder spirit of uh, the Gener Generation Equality Forum. And uh, Canada continues to welcome governments, civil society organizations, uh, philanthropic organizations uh, from all the regions to join uh, the Alliance. So I really encourage uh, some of you um, that are participating today to be part of, of, um, of this Alliance. Um, I would like to end here, and um, I believe that I haven't uh, taken more than the 10 minutes that she had um, allocated to me, Jez. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate that. That was wonderful and, and thorough to get such an overview and then go into the details. And I think we can all appreciate and feel encouraged um, that there is such a, that you've got going ahead and advocating such a bold approach to feminism and, and what that brings, the, the gender equality, empowerment, intersectionality, and um, the amplifying of the voices that we already have, but, but the need to do so and putting it into action to see um, the, the alliances of feminist movements as a whole is um, certainly inspiring. So thank you. It's a wonderful way to kick this off and, and to get this dialogue going. Thank you very much. Um, we've got five minutes um, that we'd like to put um, towards um, idea, um, to ideas board about what um, you understand by feminist leadership and what is that to you? I'm putting it up now. Mm -hmm. I'll just share the link in the chat. Okay, if you go into the chat, I've just shared the link for the ideas board. And the question that we have is, what do you understand by feminist leadership? Um, I hope everybody can see the link to the ideas board that I've just put in the chat. Yeah, we can see the link. Okay, so if you click on the link and then you go to the red, to the green uh, plus sign, you are able to put in your comments. Lift as you lead, empowering. Leading the future with people with care, vulnerability, and candor. Um, our next comment says, 
It is leadership that is spearheaded by females. Leadership that believes in equity, equality, educating out the negative and false assumptions of what feminism means and represents, not any different from any male counterparts, but maybe with more sensitive, more sensitive for other feeling for other feelings with care. It's a leader for women movement, also believing on advocacy for sexes, women on all, on the lead in all sectors. Educating out the negative and false assumptions of what feminism means and represents. Women not only knowing their rights, but have agency to exercise them. For me, it, for me, for all women, including the LGBTQI women, in which we can all put accountability. Okay, the ideas board is still open for you to put in some more of your thoughts on what you understand by feminist leadership. I'll hand back to you, Jess. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nomti, for that. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Emma Kalia. She is the chair of Southern Africa Gender Protocol Alliance in Malawi. Um, Emma, you um, are going to talk us through um, what it looks like in the leading um, and leading the action coalition six on the feminist movements and leadership, um, specifically um, from a Malawi view. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. And uh, exciting to see you online. Um, yeah, just a small correction. I'm chairperson of the Alliance in the region, but based in Malawi. So that is the correction that I can make. <clears throat> uh, I'll pick on uh, from where my colleague from Canada stopped. Malawi, Canada, and the uh, Netherlands, they are co-chairing, they are co-leaders of the uh, Action Coalition 6, with also several organizations working alongside organizations like Gender Links and, and others, are uh, advancing the issue of uh, the feminist movements. Let me mention that Malawi, uh, as a country, all of us working with our government, we agreed on four commitments. And these commitments are as follows. The first one is that the country is to fully comply with implementation of the 4060 quota in the public appointments, which is in our Gender Equality Act, uh, also issues of recruitment, tertiary education, enrollment, in accordance with the provisions of the Gender Equality Act. Secondly, Malawi also commits to adopt a legislative quota of 50% to attain equal representation of women in elected positions. That is very exciting to all of us, I'm sure, in the region, that is exciting because we've been talking about this for a very long time. The third element is to commit to allocate a, <clears throat> a channel of 10% of development financial resources to national gender equality mechanisms, especially for women's rights and women and youth-led grassroots organizations, including informal groups to address gender equality. And the final one is to commit to mobilize and support feminist movements that promote action participation, active participation of women and girls, boys, and men to advance gender equality, peace, and human rights. So you can see we are standing with those four commitments. So 
what has happened so far, some of you may wish to recall that in April, Malawi uh, championed the first ever uh, generation equality conference. They may have happened elsewhere, the bigger ones that were in Paris and, and Mexico, but Malawi, knowing the, the position that we have taken, we did champion this in the region and we invited many leaders to, to Malawi. Many people participated and we had several areas that we were focusing on, making sure that we are in line with what we, had, we have committed as a country, are working alongside our governments, are working alongside other partners, even the private sector, to ensure that things are happening. So we mobilized women, we mobilized the youth exactly of what we have committed. We mobilized men, we mobilized the business sector, we mobilized different groups and we're in that convening for three days. Uh, we are happy that we are joined by our colleagues from the region, from Africa, but even beyond Africa. The, the journey has started. Now that the journey has started, I think it is up to us, civil society, to follow up with our governments in terms of their commitments. Malawi being, uh, as Alliance being closer to Malawi, that is, has committed the four areas, but also has committed to work alongside the other governments in ensuring that the movements grow and they grow better and they make a difference for women. I think it is our duty that we follow up each and every day if these things are happening. We do not want to come back later and start talking about the same things that all of us we've seen coming, of course, in between there was COVID, but let us forget a bit about that, though it was a big issue, but for us is how best can we work alongside our governments and ensure that things that they have committed are happening. I would be <coughs> further really requesting each one of us, especially the Alliance members, that we need to, to, to strengthen our movement as Alliance first. And when we strengthen our Alliance, surely we'll be reaching out again like we used to do before. Let us not just rely on the, the barometer only at the end of the year. In the old days when we get our barometer, we should be a measure now. If it's possible, I would be also asking that the membership within the, the region, for instance, in Southern Africa, we need to see if we can also put an element of the uh, movement monitoring. So that when we are doing our barometer, it should show that what has happened so far in terms of the commitments that member states have made. So we'll be following up on the same. It will be easy for us. Everybody knew the alliance as a mechanism of accountability. So we need to strengthen our alliance in this area. We need to train our alliance members and all, all those that are interested so that we are able to follow up and make our governments accountable in line with the commitments that we have made. Meantime, everybody is complaining that the movements are not vibrant. Why should it be like that? If you ask me and my Corinne online, my, my sister Chigez is there and many others who are online, We'll be saying that yes, COVID contributed to this slowdown, but we should not remain complacent that, okay, because there was COVID and then let us keep quiet. I think it is time that we now, with the support that we'll be getting from our partners, like my colleague from Canada said, it is time for us now to up the gear and start doing exactly what we were doing before, so that at the end of it all, we should be able to sit back and say, we've done what we wanted to do we've also made sure that our governments are doing exactly what they committed to do. Cheap talk cannot be allowed anymore. We can talk and talk, but if we are not uh, doing action like the action coalitions are asking us, it will be difficult for us to stand tall and justify why we should be existing as one as an alliance, but also as those that are interested in seeing things change. We've lamented enough, but I think it is time to take action. So I'm calling upon each one of us that let us wake up and do the correct things and make sure that uh, the, what we are calling feminist leadership is being achieved progressively. We cannot sit and relax and think that things are going to move on their own. Colleagues, you allow me because I needed to share my time, a little time for now because we are also talking about men, how men 
the same question that you are asking, how would the men come in and support the feminist leadership? I have Marcel with me from Malawi. Marcel is the chairperson of the Men for Gender Equality in Malawi, but also the vice chair of the Men Engage Alliance uh, in Malawi. So Marcel, would you mind to speak? I think we only have three minutes. So I'll, I'll donate those three minutes to you so that you can also speak in terms of how men are supporting the feminist leadership. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Emma Kalia. Uh, like you have already introduced me, my name is Marcel Chisi. I'm the national chairperson for the Men for Gender Equality Now and also vice chair for the Men Engage Alliance in Malawi. Uh, indeed, it's true that in, uh, as we strive to build the feminist movement in this part of the region, uh, we need also to have men who are also committed to the ideals of feminism. And I think this I've always said in all the fora because I know that now we are seeing some organizations that uh, might indicate that they are engaging men, but I hope they are engaging men for gender justice. They are engaging men to support the cause of women, to support the cause of the girl child. I think that's the movement that we are talking about. So if there are other organizations who are not doing it in that direction, maybe that's something different. So as we strive to build a strong feminist movement, I think we need to have uh, a strong allies with the, the, the men's movement. And the men's movement is accountable to the feminist movement. How? Uh, so we don't want to see a situation where the men's movements uh, take over the work of the feminist movement, but rather to support the feminist movement in its endeavor to achieve gender equality. Because if we are not careful, in some cases, you'll find that the, the men's movement might end up you know, like taking lead. We don't want that. We want them to be supporters. We want men's movement to be allies. We want men's movements to be partners to the feminist movement. So that in as much as it's practical, where issues in the around men being retrogressive in supporting gender equality agenda. We want more men to come in and challenge fellow men and say, we cannot continue to live in a stone age in a modern world. So I, I think it's very important that uh, uh, partners from across the region should see how to network with existing men's organizations. As I think many of them are members of what we now call the Men Engage Alliance. So almost in every country, there is a Men Engage Alliance, particularly in this part of the region, and it is time to link up with them. They are not enemies. They are actually friends, allies, and partners in advancing the feminist movement, women's human rights, and the gender equality agenda. I stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Um, I hope our time is, um, <laughs> is gone now. Uh, but it's simply to say that uh, Marcel is our allies in Malawi with many other colleagues. We, we're making a lot of progress around that, and I'm very happy that uh, they, are, they are in this space helping out to ensuring that men are made to account for certain things they have been doing in the past, but also desist from negative masculinities. So I, 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 let me stop there. If there will be any questions, we will take. Uh, otherwise, I may be stepping out because I'm in a meeting in Addis, so I had to step out of a meeting to make sure that I'm part of the <laughs> meeting. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hello, can you hear me, Emma? Yes, I can. Okay, I wanted to add on, during the elections of uh, this year in Kenya, in 9th August 2022, I can say, at least women right now, we've reached the two-third gender balance. And I've seen we've already produced five governors, women on the Council of Governors. And uh, Nakuru County, it was able to elect 10 women in the selective posts of a uh, member of assemblies. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we, I did not want to go into too much detail because I know that there's a lot that maybe we'll share here, but I think we are progressing well in the region, especially the region I'm talking about, Eastern Southern Africa, where we seem to be progressing well, which we need to move uh, so fast. 
uh, our leaders are now slowly adapting to our cause and also like for Malawi, there are a lot of things that have happened regardless of there are certain things that are happening in terms of the economy, but in terms of women's leadership, we can visibly see it, that it is there. And uh, we really applaud our leadership that uh, they are moving alongside us uh, to change the status quo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I know you need to step out now, Mama Emma, but thank you very much. No, and I'll, Marcel, I'll, be, I'll, thank stay, you. I'll stay on for like another 10 minutes, then I can step out. Okay, fantastic. Mekolin will be wondering why I step out, <laughs> but I will stay on for 10 minutes, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. And thank you, Marcel, for coming in there and, and speaking of the, the strong alliances um, that we need in order to make this work. What a poignant milestone for us all. Um, you know, so often in, in government, we've just seen feminism being used as a political tool and even a political weapon. And now to see that the tables are turning and, and we can see that you're going ahead, taking the lead and, and Canada as well, just speaking beforehand. It is, it is certainly encouraging and I can imagine it will be a topic of discussion around the dinner table tonight. <laughs> um, we'd like to, I'd like to bring up um, um, Sifas, um, Sifas Sami, sorry, Sifas Sami Amdube, so our international, from International Idea. Um, she's going to be talking about a Women Lead Africa campaign and the women's political participation, um, which is fantastic. Um, Sifas, are you are you there? Let me see. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, <laughs> I'm here, Jess. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Greetings, sisters. Greetings, uh, brothers from across uh, Africa and across the world. Uh, thank you for Gender Links uh, and partners for organizing uh, this important uh, forum around feminism. Uh, but because of 10 minutes, I'm just going to go through quickly in terms of what um, uh, the Women Lead Africa campaign is all about. But just in one sentence on what International IDEA does, International IDEA is, a, uh, is an intergovernmental organization which is working on three pillars around democracy, that is constitutional building, uh, political participation and representation, as well as elections assistance. For example, what just happened in Kenya will also be there in terms of uh, uh, providing technical assistance. So we're made up of 32 member states currently, uh, mainly from Europe, but we do have uh, Zizi Canada as part of international idea as well. Uh, just to go quickly, in terms of the Women Lead Africa uh, pro, uh, campaign, uh, we started uh, this campaign in 2019, late 2019, but uh, from realizing that in terms of feminism, we are lacking behind in the issue of the feminist approach to politics. Because while we were embracing feminism, the feminist approach to politics uh, that we were uh, doing in uh, international idea was a bit weak. So we came up with a coalition, uh, sorry, a consortium of about six organizations, including Gender Links, Femnet, uh, Ifan, Padare. Padare, I'm, I'm sure those in the men's movement know it. Uh, we've got Ifan, it's a, it's a university in Senegal. Uh, but we've got FAWE also working with uh, girls' education uh, in uh, across Africa, but based in Nairobi. And then we've got women and law Southern Africa. Firstly, in terms of conceiving this project, we realized that while the feminism is a doctrine and uh, concerned about emancipation of women, um, embracing areas of women's life, such as their development, role in political, social, and cultural uh, and economic affairs, it also talks about women's rights and freedom. And if we're talking about women's emancipation in political leadership, we needed then to come up with a contribution to say, what is our approach for women to participate in politics? And that approach can be none other than the feminist approach to politics. So this project then uh, realized that we need to engage 
um, different rights holders, different gatekeepers in terms of the political participation, uh, um, or in, in terms of the political participation uh, sphere, uh, because we do realize that while uh, there is women are still lagging behind in terms of political participation, as um, I think as of now it was around 24% in Africa in terms of, of per women parliamentarians, we'll see how it fares when gender links produces the next WPP barometer next year, but things are still really, really low. So this uh, Women Lead Africa project or campaign, it's our critique to patriarchy to say, why are we still so far behind when 2030 is approaching, is, uh, when 2030 is around the corner? And therefore we had to put our heads together to say, whom do we engage? Who is an expert in different areas so that we can uh, then um, have a contribute towards a fruitful approach towards women's political participation. Uh, the main thing was to engage um, or to really try to critique the systems that are existing across Africa in terms of why women are lagging behind in terms of political participation. I'm sure some of you have seen a video and a journalist who was interviewing uh, Mother Karua from Kenya, who was asking a question, is Kenya ready for a female president? And that question has been asked over and ever, uh, over and over again. Even here in South Africa, it has been asked. What what kind of question in 2022 uh, is uh, are you asking whether a country is ready for a female president? Is a female president not a human being? So those are the things that we need we need to critique when we are doing um, the Women Lead Africa campaign. So. We also realize, realize that women's political participation and the realization of their rights in, in, is a change in the entire structure of society, but must be made effective. And this can be done only through the political machinery. Unfortunately, this is our fate, that we have to penetrate the political machinery in order for women in leadership to participate, in order for women leadership to be equal in terms of 50%. I know Gender Links and the Alliance have been running the 50-50 campaign, but there is no shortcut except to penetrate the political machinery. That's why is international idea through the Women Lead Africa together with the consortium members, we therefore said we're going to contribute to the feminist approach to politics through knowledge generation and dissemination, through technical assistance, including capacity building and a platform creation through dialogues. And one important theme is about intergenerational dialogues, which brings in together the young women, the young men in terms of um, dialoguing around political participation and representation. But we also realize that it is important to have peer-to-peer -peer learning from across, across countries, from across districts, from across uh, sub-regions, for example, East Africa sharing with Southern Africa, North Africa sharing with West Africa. So peer-to-peer -peer is one big, big thing that we're going to be doing in the next phase of the Women Lead Afri Elite Africa campaign. The Women Lead Africa campaign tech, we borrowed it from Femnet. Uh, their tech is actually women must lead. They are not apologizing. They say women must lead. So I think that is a very critical approach in terms of the feminist uh, uh, theory or, of politics. Uh, we work um, with government ministries, uh, parliaments, uh, including regional parliaments, local authorities, women and male politicians, uh, election management bodies, regional economic committees, media, and the African Union uh, in terms of uh, trying to see how we can uh, contribute towards enhancing women's political participation in Africa. While it is still, uh, uh, we're still maybe around less than 50% uh, in terms of women's political participation, we have, however, raised the, uh, the bar in terms of critiquing what is happening across the, the African countries. Why, for example, women should be asked 
to bring in proof that they are married when they are registering for elections, something like that. It does still happen in some parts of the continent. And obviously why women should still seek permission from their husbands or from their uh, boyfriends to participate or to campaign in elections. And why we still have high campaign figures, uh, high campaign fees, which makes women uh, left behind in terms of political uh, participation. We know the, histo the historical imbalances uh, that women have faced. We know what we need to correct systematically and socially so that women can be emancipated in the field of political participation. At the same time, we have our partners who have different strengths. For example, uh, Padare, in terms of the men's movement, they are engaging those gatekeepers, the men, from a young age, from the students' movement to say, what are men bringing to the table? How are men lifting the women up? in terms of uh, political participation. And then we've got the elders, we call them the elders, the more seasoned politicians, female politi politicians, because guess what? They do not want to move the seat and they will never move the seat because to them, politics has become a career. That means then we'll have a generational gap in terms of who will participate in the next round of elections because the elders are not moving. How many of them have you seen sleeping in parliament or sleeping in council when council is in session? So we need to really critique those imbalances and speak out when we see the wrongs and speak out and rewrite our history as the feminist movement. We talk about also media participation to say when media comes together, what are they reporting on? Are they reporting on the hot stories? And why is women's political participation not a hot story? Why is only shaming the movement or shaming the bodies of the women uh, a hot story instead of the value that they bring to the table in developing each country? So this Women Lead Africa campaign is, is trying to address those, but also bringing to the table the evidence on the ground in terms of the numbers, in terms of, the, of what people are experiencing on the ground. We note that uh, these days during each election, there's the situation room on women in terms of violence. We need that evidence when we speak about the women, women lead Africa campaign. And when we talk about the feminist approach to politics. So those are the things that we have been trying to do as the Women Lead Africa campaign, uh, but it's just a contribution and we need the masses uh, through other organizations, through the coal action coalitions to really raise the flag and raise the bar in terms of the non-negotiables when it comes to uh, feminist um, movements in politics. Uh, with those few words, I think, uh, this is in a nutshell what we have been doing as international idea and our consortium members, which includes uh, gender links and uh, which includes other organizations that I've mentioned before. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Saviso Sami, we really are grateful for walking us through such a significant campaign at such an important time as we are. Uh, the, I mean, women in politics throughout Africa and critiquing existing systems throughout Africa is something that we've all been waiting for. And what that means for the bigger picture is of such great consequence um, and how, what it looks like from an everyday situation um, and throughout politics. So very grateful. Thank you very much for uh, your participation and filling us in um, with such excellent points. We, we have... Um, from South Africa coming up. Um, Numpumalelo Matabele from the One in Nine campaign. Um, she's coming forth to talk about feminist leadership um, told from the LGBTQIA and community um, and from that standpoint and where we're at with that. So thank you very much. Numpumalelo, are you here? I am here, Jess. Thank you Hi so there. much. <laughs> Uh, good evening, greetings to everyone. Um, thank you so much to Gender Links for actually creating this space um, for women in dialogue and making sure that 
uh, feminism is one of the topics that is really discussed uh, during this year, which is, as we all know, it's such a contested uh, topic and ideology uh, when it comes to, is it for everyone? Um, I see a hand, Helen Kutia has a hand up. Yes. Yes, Helen, would you like to go forward? Do you have a question? Okay, since it's off now, we'll just ask everybody to put their comments and questions in the chat while Sumbumi speaks. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, everyone. Yeah, so thank you very much, Genderlinks, for actually creating this space um, and for allowing me to have this conversation with all of you about feminist leadership. Um, I wanted to really start us off with, you know, the, the saying from Chimamanda that says uh, feminism is for everyone. And with such a contested topic, you wanted to think through what does it mean when it says feminism is for everyone? What does she actually mean? And I wanted, when I thought of it, I, I looked at how that calls on us, uh, all of us, basically to not separate ourselves uh, to the system that we see as oppressive, but to really see um, ourselves as part of it because we are all conditioned within a system that, that is patriarchal, that really uh, then leads to how we uh, respond to certain things in life. It calls on us to be aware of our own power in all the spaces that we, we basically uh, come into and that we occupy. And it causes us on, on us to really have an intersectional analysis on the social issues that we face and to acknowledge that for the longest time, women have been at the you know, bottom uh, of, the, of the food chain and that it calls for equality. And what we mean by equality, is it the 50-50? Is it opening doors? What does that mean? And I think that's where a lot of women actually struggle with identifying with the concept of feminism. So when I wanted to talk about feminist leadership, I wanted to really talk about two events, uh, two very historical events uh, in my life that I have been part of, that for me have stood out uh, in terms of feminist leadership, uh, whether they were you know, um, named feminist leadership or, or, or not, but I wanted to speak about these two events. Uh, the one event really in the LGBTIAQ plus community that for me, uh, you know, showed feminist leadership was the beginning and the starting of the organization, the Forum for the Empowerment of Women. For those who do not know, this is a lesbian organization, black lesbian organization that was started um, in 2002 uh, by a group of women that actually who were activists and who were part of the movement, uh, the LGBTI movement, but saw that in everything that was done, uh, the LGBTI movement was focused on mainly male gay people. And it was specific to white gay men. And there was no space to talk about the issues and the experiences of black lesbian women. And I think the start of that, of that organization that really looked at amplifying the voices of black lesbian women, uh, bringing to the front the experiences of black lesbian women who were living in the township at the time to say, um, how do we bring about change in the lives of black lesbian women uh, as much as we say we are representing the whole LGBTI community. Um, they also challenged the LGBTI movement in terms of the, the issues around health, uh, and, and HIV AIDS, which was mainly focused on men uh, and that transmission was happening between men only and could not happen um, with lesbian women. And so this group of women started the space that eventually grew to a, a really big movement and took over the lesbian, uh, uh, the LGBTI movement in terms of calling for equality, but calling for inclusion of black lesbian women's voices in, in the LGBTI movement, but also in the larger women's movement uh, to put issues of black lesbian women on the agenda as well and be able to, you know, be able to, to, to deal with the issues uh, that all women face and not just a particular group of women. 
And for me, this example really speaks about how um, feminist leadership is really about the, uh, the redistribution of power. Um, it is transparent, it's about responsibility and accountability. Uh, because when you say you are a leader, leadership is about responsibility. It's about accountability. It's about amplifying the voices of those uh, that we see as the voiceless. I wouldn't say there are people who are voiceless, um, but there are people that are really pushed to the to the margins of 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 you know our society and whose voices are then are then not heard or their experiences are really erased from our narratives. And so feminist leadership really calls for us to bring about those voices and to create space for that that is different um, instead of shying away from what is different. And so for me, the Forum for the Empowerment of Women was that one space that actually challenged the system as it stood, um, challenged the, 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 the oppressive state of, of gender, the oppressive state of race. And for me, that brought about now a larger group of people that says, how do we really change the lives of women, but all women, not just a particular group of women. The second event that I want to really, um, I think, bring attention to is one that was a, an action that was done by the One in Nine Company, the organization that I work for, which was the disruption of uh, the Johannesburg Pride in 2012. Now, this was also another controversial, I think, time in history, because how do you disrupt a space that is created for the minority, you know, that is already being oppressed and you disrupt that space. But what One in Nine saw and what One in Nine wanted to do uh, with the disruption of the Johannesburg Pride uh, event was to say, here is a political event that was started in 1990, right at the end of the apartheid era, calling for equality for gay people the whole LGBTI community. Here is a space that has been a political voice for all queer people in the country that has now been reduced to nothing but a celebration. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the celebration, but feminist leadership says that a political space um, that is the only place where we can highlight uh, what has happened in the world, what the experiences of queer people. It is the only space where you can use, um, the one space that you can use to actually hold the state accountable to the experiences of, of queer people, to say with all the rights that we've gained uh, in, in the country, especially a country like South Africa, that you know has a constitution that has been hailed as one of the best in the world. How is that being, you know, implemented and how is that relating to the realities of people on the ground? And when those two things do not really, um, you know, are not in scale, that means there is something wrong in the system. And when you take the one tool that you can use to bring attention to these oppressive uh, systems, to bring to, to the fore the injustices that black lesbian women were facing at the time, because there were a lot of hate crimes, the killing of black lesbian women that were not highlighted by a political space that was supposed to highlight these things. So when one in nine disrupted the Johannesburg pride, it was exactly in this moment to say that uh, the pride, pride has been depoliticized and pride has erased the black bodies of queer people who were right at the beginning of the starting of Pride in 1990. Uh, we know that Bev Didier was the first black queer woman to speak uh, in Beijing. And mm -hmm. here was this history falling into the cracks. And again, white gay men taking the fall, um, the issues of class, issues of, of gender, in, in issues of race were now falling into the cracks and really not uh, being, put in the spotlight. And the space was no longer a, space, a political space where we could also get access to information in terms of what is happening in, uh, in relation to um, gay history, in relation to what is happening in the LGBTI movement. And so when that disruption happened, for me, it was 
a space of feminist leadership. Because for me, feminist leadership is about participation. It's about accountability. It is about transparency. It is about intersectionality that is mindful of the issues of gender, race, class, and sexual, inter uh, uh, sexual orientation. Um, and so when these do not happen, it calls for a radical action that says, how do we refocus on the issue that is affecting people? And so feminist leadership for me is, is one of those important tools that I think even those who, the people who are scared to really identify as feminists um, do it on a daily basis. I think uh, Ambassador Tenjo M. Tinso touched on it when she was talking about feminism to say some of the actions that she was doing uh, in the liberation struggle, where they, did they count as feminists? Were they feminists? Those actions that she did or were they not? Um, and so we might not really name things as feminists, but the actions themselves, if they, you know, center the, 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 the experiences of women and they center the experiences of the marginalized um, people, I think that is for me is feminism. And that for me is leadership. Um, feminism is really not about comfort. I think it calls on us to be uncomfortable. It calls for us to transform a system and not to tweak a system. And so uh, for me, the characteristics that of, of feminists, when they say feminists are angry, angry people or angry lesbians, or uh, we fight against everything, uh, we are bra banners, we are men haters. Um, it makes sense, right? I, I think for me with good reason, it kind of shows us what exactly feminist leadership is about because we make people uncomfortable. Feminist leadership makes you uncomfortable. It calls for you to look at your own power. It calls for you to look at where you are situated and to say, are these things that we are doing really changing the lives of the people we say we are changing? So are we changing the lives of women? Are we changing the lives of queer people? Are we changing the lives of people living with disabilities? Are we doing that work? Or have we fallen into the trap of, of being in, 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 of, uh, in a powerful place where we no longer look at the people who are really struggling at the bottom? And so feminist leadership really calls for us to constantly look at ourselves and challenge our own leadership styles. Um, mm -hmm. That's why it challenges hierarch hierarchical structures uh, where you have, you can have bosses, you can have all of that, but you need to have a participatory um, leadership, a participatory space where everyone can actually, you know, have a voice and create space for those that usually do not have a voice. Um, so these are characteristics that I, as a feminist leader, I think I accept and welcome uh, when people say I'm angry, <laughs> I'm an angry lesbian, which I am. Um, and one of the things I was thinking about was how, as, a, as an African woman, as a Black queer woman, how both my identities, um, as a feminist African woman, those both identities have been called an African. And yet here I am in person existing. I am an African, I am a feminist, and I am a gay woman. And it, it really fights against the idea that uh, feminism or being gay is an African. And so I think we should be open to really looking at feminism as a tool that will change the face of advocacy in our country, where we do not fall into the traps that our government have fallen into that we challenge ourselves, but we all, uh, as much as we challenge the systems that we say we want to change and transform, um, we don't fall into the, tra the, the traps of just tweaking a system, but that we actually go in with the idea of changing a system and making a system that is really inclusive of everyone, regardless of their differences, whether we understand them or we don't, whether we accept them or we don't, but understanding that every single human being has a right to be, a right to life, the right to freedom of choice, the right to freedom of movement, all these things that we have actually outlined in our constitutions. These are things that are really 
a right to every single person, whether we agree or disagree. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's refreshing to hear a side of just embracing that, yes, we're angry, and this is why. <laughs> and um, so thank you. Nompomalelo, thank you very much. I mean, just also bringing home, thank you for bringing home um, the message that fem feminism is as multifaceted as we are. And um, I loved the words that you touched on from Chimananda, um, that feminism is for everyone. You know, we've gone through conditioning in society. And I recall she also said um, that in order to be a feminist, she had to go through a process of unlearning in order to learn. And I think that is something that we could all do. So thank you so much for your input and, and bringing the side of the conversation um, to life. Thank you. All righty, all the way from the Seychelles. <laughs> We'd love to, um, I'd like to bring up to the floor, um, Joanna, you're the founder of Ladies Circle. Um, hello, everybody. Hello, you're going to be chatting to us about um, what feminist leadership looks like um, for a young woman and um, yeah, from that point of view. So please go ahead. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to all the protocols observed in the room. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Joanna Popono, I'm 29 years old. Yes, uh, feminism, that's a big word and I really, really love all the presentation put forward. It hasn't, I cannot say thank you to gender links uh, as much as I can say as everyone has, but thank you so much. I know we're short on time, I'll keep it concise, short and sweet. Um, Lady Soko, first of all, um, to just get into the nitty gritty, has been in effect since 1930. Uh, it's basically in its very itself an organization where women are circling uh, internationally, locally, and uh, what we do in, in its very nutshell is an association is we have national projects, we do different organizing of community developments, but we don't do it only locally, we're linked up internationally in more than 44 countries uh, with 13,000 members. We work around friendship and service, where we work as a sisterhood, close together with uh, Roundtable International. And in its very self, we are a group of women from 18 to 45 years old. I'm the youngest, 29 years of age. And with a motto of friendship and service, in 2019, I opened and founded it here in Seychelles since I felt it was a need to create uh, a sisterhood as a young woman, um, feminism is something that I grew up with since I never studied here in my country in Seychelles. I grew up in Bahrain. I'm a Tanzanian born. At the same time, with all that diversity around me, uh, Seychelles is a very small country with 95,000 population, but we have a lot of challenges, especially in the youth sector. Um, as a young student who worked in the Supreme Court of Seychelles in the National Assembly, as well as in the Civic Department as a Youth Culture Sports Commissioner for four years. I've worked very closely with the Women Leaders Network and different networks around here in Seychelles to spearhead different movements where we can advocate for the minority, where our young women's voices are not being heard not because they can't be heard, but because the, the, it, the difficulty to actually put forward one's pain, one's uh, doubts is, is very prominent here in Seychelles. Um, for me, feminism is in itself self-awareness, self-care, as well as caring for others, uh, dismantling bias in inclusion, sharing power, responsibilities, as well as being transparent in how power is being used. But at the same time, the accountability measures of collaborations and respecting feedbacks, uh, encouraging and being courageous to come forward where as a young person, others will doubt you, but having zero tolerance to being put down and having their voice shut. This is the reason why I opened our Pleiadi Circle Seychelles because we have a lot of uh, young people here who are going through that uh, per pressure. And it's important as a feminist leader um, to always look up to the leaders in front of us. And 
listening to everyone today in, in this dialogue, uh, it goes to show exactly why we are actually in need to have more dialogues such as this. Uh, leaders who are enabling other leaders is this is where the power is. For a young generation such as uh, COVID-19's era where you have a lot of individuals who ended up uh, having a major financial issue, major, you can, you can name every single thing uh, pertaining to COVID-19, but Lady Circle Seychelles as a young led uh, movement, we went through social media. We had a lot of doors shut down. We had a lot of restriction, but it didn't limit us. As a young leader, what we needed to do uh, in, in, in a sense, what I had to do is find a different tool to engage, to get the voice of the young people out there. And social media was the one tool that all of us young generation are very adapted with. So working together with our uh, sectors of different organizations with the citizens engagement platform here in Seychelles, the Lady Circle movement ended up launching different petitions, but at the same time, um, going to the social media platforms and engaging other uh, youths to speak out if they're having difficulties, uh, what are the main problems. Uh, just to give an example of how when one door shuts, how social media comes into a very uh, useful era uh, in the young eras of uh, the generation we're in right now. In the context of uh, Lady Circle International, we had a bleeding ladies movement where a lot of uh, adults here had a very bad uh, feedback concerning why does Lady Circle want to fight for free pads in, in, in a situation where it's not needed? We fought for it for over one year uh, because we did not get the support nor the finance pertaining to our campaign. We went to social media and did not give up. The challenges was there. We were in, a lot of our members were insulted for doing something that was completely out of the box. Talking about period, something that women go through, something that we all know is difficult, especially in a financial crisis such as COVID-19 with minimum wage families going through a financial crisis. But our determination didn't stop. We ended up working with the National Assembly since with my background already being in that sector with law, we ended up uh, rallying young people on social media to circulate petition because we were not allowed to go to house to door during the COVID-19 lockdown. In that time where media was used in a negative way to insult every effort that we were doing, we used it in a silver lining where our social media campaign went viral our petition received 500 signatures. And once that happened, I personally went to the National Assembly, presented it as per law to engage governmental sector to change uh, a simple law where it will allow the minority, the families that are in the average uh, uh, basic salary to receive free pads uh, at home and in schools for the young girls. In 20, this year, uh, January 2022, uh, we received a good feedback from the very president of our country, where we were called in and were informed that our petition was received, um, our voice was heard, and each and every single person's voice that signed this petition was heard. And in 2022, January, a law was passed in Seychelles with pads uh, for all young girls, adolescent girls in schools and young females, uh, professional females will receive pads wherever they are, minimum wage or otherwise. It was a big, big very big movement for us considering even though we didn't, we didn't get a lot of sponsorship, a lot of support, we didn't give up. Um, Feminism is, is, is a very broad, broad um, 
word. Uh, it's it's not something that can be defined, in my opinion. It's definable to one person, uh, to to each person, uh, to 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 a sense. Whereby at the end of the day, each each person, each individual in this room right now in the Zoom link uses it in its in its very full capacity based on what they believe in, based on what they're fighting for, and it, it works. It, it's about bringing two different worlds together and bridging the gap uh, where one faces a challenge, another comes in and helps. In Seychelles, uh, we have a lot of young people now pushing forward to utilizing social media as a tool to actually advance their voice, as a tool to actually work in educating and sensitizing and hearing other voices that's not being heard whether the media platform doesn't want to advocate for us. We have our education that allows us to teach others or be the voice for others that it's, it's not possible in, in that era of time. Um, as a young uh, uh, leader myself, the one thing that I, I would always uh, support and promote is whenever there's a space given, whether it's small, whether it's just online, if it is a space, then that's all that's needed. It doesn't have to be flashy, it doesn't have to be big. It all that all that matters is the motivation and the will that you have to actually fight for what you believe in. And a lot of young people here in Seychelles are just like me. <laughs> I ended up deciding to, to give up my uh, university degree to continue fighting for different re law reforms different projects and work together with the Lady Circle International uh, sectors to link up and join with different countries to educate and sensitize Seychelles that there is more to, to, to the project arena. It's, it's about changing lives, not just doing it in a similar uh, fashion as before. And our leader right now here, Madame Azemia, who is the women's leader for the African Women's Leaders Network, works very closely with our association. And we are soon going to be opening the youth sector of uh, AWLN here to engage on more dialogues. And at the end of the day, it, it's important for role model, young role models to be seen. And this is what we are doing here in Seychelles. The more they see that it's okay for young people to voice out, it's okay for young people to say no, it's okay for young people to put out their opinion without being biased, or talked down to. And once they see that courage, wherever it is, whatever situation they're going through, whether it's mental health, whether it's um, issues in their family household, the fact that they're seeing someone stepping out, this for me was, was during the COVID-19 was the biggest achievement um, to hear our president calling us and saying, listen, Lady Circle, we've heard it. Thank you. Um, you have put on a very concise project and we will give you the support. It was, it was a biggest movement for us where we didn't ask for any recognition. We just wanted the change to happen regardless of, of whether, whether we were going to, whether we are being uh, discriminated or not. And discrimination is something that is always gonna be there for young people. Uh, we will always have to sit in the back seat. We will always have to wait for our turn. But this is the time and era whereby, as all our speakers has pointed out, uh, if we don't move, if we don't voice out, then all the other young people will, will also not do it considering they believe it's, it's not okay. They believe that at the end of the day, they should wait. But if we wait, we're never going to see the change that we want to see. And the one thing that I always advocate for all of my young sectors here in Seychelles, especially when I was the commissioner for youth for almost four years, it, it's not about the recognition. It's about the impact. Who are you choosing to impact is more important than than who wants the, the level of recognition where you need to sell your soul so that they will support you. 
uh, we are living in an era whereby a lot of young people here in Seychelles, I'm sure also in all other African regions are waking up and are fighting back yes. and saying, no, enough is enough. We are young, we have studied enough, we have learned and we're willing to learn more, but our voice is also something that needs to be heard and our space that is not there, no worries, we shall create the space. And this is what I'm very proud of in terms of how Lady Circle International has supported uh, us here in Seychelles. And once we open Lady Circle uh, in Seychelles um, and we work together with uh, different sectors, it, it opened a different floodgate of uh, people. Everyone started coming in and they started voicing out and saying, we didn't know that you were here. We also have the same doubts and we believe that this is something that is also for us. So leadership is very important because at the end of the day, it can be something small that you're doing. It can be something simple that you're voicing out. It can be something even that is insignificant, but it's something that you're passionate about. The moment someone hears it, the moment someone relates to it, that for me is impactful. It's not about impacting 1,000 people. It's about impacting only one and let it have a ripple effect. That's more than enough. Absolutely. And thank you, Joanna. This, this, is, this is what we're doing here. And thank you, mm. Gender Links, for actually giving us that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna. I mean, the story, your story of inspired determination is something that we can all walk away with today um, and to go forward with in our own space um, because it does come down to determination. And you, um, Lady Circle, from what I, the understanding that you've given us, um, uh, the values of sisterhood, friendship, and service, I mean, Thank you. That is, it's so important because we have to go ahead and dismantle. There's a falsehood that we dismantle that women don't work well with other women. And that is not true. And, you know, organizations and movements such as something that has been done with you in Lady Circle is um, proof of that. And the world needs to see it. And we need to go ahead with that mantle. So thank you very much. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, Numti, um, I know we can, um, is there some time to open up a discussion and some questions? Um, can we go back to the ideas board or shall we just open up the floor for discussions from the listeners? Yeah, maybe let's just open up the floor for some discussion. I've put up the link for the ideas board um, on, on, on the chat. And the other question we're asking is, what does feminist leadership look like for you on a day-to-day -day basis? So if anybody wants to maybe uh, comment, you're more than welcome. I'm sharing the ideas board. Hi, I, I just want to thank you for these presentations and uh, very, very encouraging. And it is the speakers are speaking eloquently on really feminist leadership. Um, and as I said last year, in I mean, a few years back in the same platform here, Gender Links, the challenge that we have is the attitude of women towards other women. This is an area which we need to seriously focus on and address. The emancipation of feminism leadership is being compromised by females themselves who are not willing either to register to vote or who are willing to, to be hoodwinked by men to say, look, don't vote a fellow woman. She's incapable, she's like this. Um, we need to, the women to claim this space because when you look at the, the population uh, in almost every country, the majority are women. Those who put male leaders in councils, in parliament are also women. And I think it is time that we start walking the talk. You know, we may come up with all these blueprints, we may come up with these quota systems, but as long as the, the voting Kind of the voters do not appreciate um, female leadership. We are, 
going to go to move in cycles. I'm glad with what is happening in Kenya, that is symbolic that it's possible, it's doable. And as I said earlier on, we have elections going on around like in the Southern region here, Zimbabwe, South Africa, you know, we are having these elections coming, but we need uh, proactivity. We need to speak to the voting um, candidates to say, look, let us give women an op a chance, an option, uh, an alternative so that we see uh, change. So that's just my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Piri. I see a hand up from Sazi. Yeah, namaste. Uh, I, I, I would like to beg to differ from what Dr. Piri just alluded, that uh, women uh, uh, do not support each other. I feel like uh, what we need to look at right now is the handing over of men to women, because most of the time we always speak of women empowering. And whenever you're empowering someone, that means you will always be above that person. The reason why maybe women are not actually supporting each other is because we have been empowered for many years and that empowering is not working. So right now, uh, I feel like as uh, women or feminist leadership is looking for is for it's handing up and uh, giving someone a hand to come up to the same level that men are because um, as much as we can say women are not supporting each other but that little thing of making women do not support each other comes back to the masculine side and yet again uh, I, 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 I like to allude of what uh, um, the speaker from one in nine was actually speaking about saying that uh, our queer people uh, really um, or diversity of, of women really need to be seen in power because we are diverse as women uh, within this platform and not everybody is fat like me, not everybody is um, short like me. We are all diverse, even within the women's struggle. So if we can then bring all the women back to the table and have one voice, we can have this leadership because leadership doesn't mean that there's only one leader. Everybody can lead in their own silos or in their own corners. It's just that we have to have one this voice. And what is happening in uh, Kenya is really amazing. And uh, I, I'm applauding the men that are involved because they are showing that impacts of saying we are including, we are not including women, but we are involving women to what, what they want to do or to what, what is happening or what's going to do. So let's stop including, each, uh, let's stop wanting to be included, but let's be uh, uh, involved in all the decisions they are making involved from the ground roots because some people do not uh, specifically look at what is happening in the ground. They just want to be included when everything is okay. That's why we we'll always be empowered. So if we, we get ourselves involved from the beginning until the end, we're gonna reach the feminist leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Sazi. Um, Fiona, I'll give you a minute and a half and then we take Godfrey and then uh, Jazz will close for us. Um, Fiona? Okay, Godfrey, maybe go first, a minute and a half. No, I'm and here. Okay, hi, Fiona. I am okay. here. Hi, hi. Um, some may remember me from Toyando Victim Empowerment Program, but the only point I really want to make is that having lived in a rural area for 40 years in South Africa, uh, what really, really disturbs me is that nothing is reaching or very, very little is reaching rural women because the community-based organizations are not being supported. And frankly, a lot of the, for example, the, um, the calls for proposals and that sort of thing, they're far too sophisticated uh, for these groups. So they're getting nowhere. 
And I, I, I've been trying to understand why funders do not recognize this and make it easier or at least appoint mentors or, or capacity builders to actually work hands-on with some of these people. That's just my five cents worth. Thank you so much, Fiona Godfrey. A minute and a half and we are closing. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Lee, uh, Jenna Lee, uh, for this space. I'm Godfrey from Uganda, and I'm really grateful to everyone. Sorry, Godfrey, maybe switch off your video so that your bandwidth can be okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, my concern is that uh, the rationale of, you know, uh, rural women are uh, being empowered uh, of femi feminist leadership, being empowered to that of uh, um, urban women. There is a big variance there. So what are you trying to do or what will you do to try to bridge some of this gap? Uh, making sure that uh, even rural women are, are equally uh, empowered uh, to that of urban women. Because when we talk of uh, empowerment or feminist or feminism leadership empowerment, we look at it majorly the what? Uh, the, the urban women. So why are we still leaving uh, the rural women behind? Because if we leave them behind, we shall be doing nothing. And then another thing is that um, I would be glad to see that uh, feminist leadership is not only limited to uh, the political sector, but must cut across uh, the different sectors. That is in health. I would uh, wish to see uh, uh, feminist. Let me, let me speak about it tomorrow. I'm still around. Oh, Friday. sorry, sorry. Let me mute that better. person. As we could arrange for something maybe Friday early morning or Thursday. Um, we shall speak on Thursday, 2.30, uh, if that's fine. I'm trying to just mute, sorry. I'm just trying to mute. Okay, I think that's muted. Sorry, Godfrey, about that. Okay, Jess, I think we've lost Godfrey. Oh, dear. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, carry on, please, Godfrey. Okay, thank you very much. So I was still telling you people uh, that um, I would be very glad to see feminist leadership uh, in different sectors, not only political sectors. That is, you know, in education, in health, in finance, and even in religion, because uh, the bottleneck uh, to, 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 you know, to the success of this movement uh, might be the religious, uh, cultural, political objections. So before breaking the barrier, before breaking some of the religious, uh, uh, maybe cultural, political biases, then we shall be doing nothing. And how are we going to do this? Uh, one of the speakers uh, talked about uh, intergenerational dialogues. So me, I would think, that one alone will not be enough. We must also bring in board religious leaders. Because different religions, when it comes to a family, even, you know, uh, things like um, interreligious dialogues as well, with the male inclusion. Because if we continue pushing for this, all women keep on pushing uh, for this, without engaging men actively, then it will all be a vain effort. So I would ask in my conclusion that we should not leave out rural women and we make sure that we balance that rationale, you know, of empowering women in the rural setups as well, not only urban setups. In that way, I think, women, you know, uh, the movement will achieve a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you so Thank much.
from Uganda. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Godfrey, for sharing that. And um, I want to thank you um, from myself and on behalf of um, Bologna Women's Network, just want to thank you all our organizers, our hosts and our partners for setting up um, such a dialogue as this, creating both a dynamic and a safe space to have these discussions. And thank you, a big thank you to our speakers who have taken the time to share their stories with us. Um, without you, we wouldn't have this um, diverse content and poignant content um, to, to throw into the space and to talk through and to talk about. I encourage um, the listeners to carry on and carry through with this dialogue. Um, take what you've um, heard here and talk, it, talk through it with your networks. Um, take it home today. Um, may it not be a silo of information um, in this space. So thank you very much. And thank you, Nomti and Gender Links, WVL, um, Gender Protocol Alliance, um, Amplify Change, and Canada Global Affairs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jess. Thank you so much. I've got, I've just thank dropped you. the link. I've just dropped the link for um, WVL. Um, website. website where it talks yes so the next um, there's a dialogue coming up on gender and diversity it's on the 20th of September so dial into that and the link will take you through to um, the information for that for all our listeners thank you thank you